morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time you are listening to this podcast. My name is James Albon and you're listening to episode 9 of The Last Line. I hope you're all having a wonderful week. Um, Thank you very much for joining me. If you're new to the show, then please do hit subscribe on iTunes and follow us on Spotify. There's many ways to listen to the podcast, including TuneIn, Stitcher, uh, Blueberry, Podbean, CastBox, and through the power of psychic abilities. That's that. That's not true. Um, If... You're feeling uh, extra generous, then you can head over to patreon.com forward slash the last line and um, give us some money to support the show and keep it running. Um, I mean, also, it would help, you know, we could make it a more of a regular occurrence, which I know you'd be really excited about. This week, I speak to music pioneers Eberhard Craneman. And Harold Grosskopf of uh, their newly formed partnership, Krautwerk. Uh, Eberhard was one of the founding members of the band Kraftwerk and also released uh, a number of albums under the pseudonym Fritz Müller. Uh, Harold um, was part of Ashra but also uh, was responsible for the album Synthesis, which continues to grow a huge cult following to this day. They're they're two pioneers of the German electronic music scene, and they've teamed up to give us some more experimental electronic German musical loveliness. Um, I spoke to Eberhard and Harold uh, earlier this year over Skype uh, where we talk about everything from the lack of experimentalism in mainstream modern music, uh, the need to leave imperfections in, uh, in art. But first, we talk about how the two came together to form their project. Well, we met uh, in 1960, uh, okay, oh, 19, yeah. in 2016, yes. uh, during a, a uh, festival, a little festival near here, and uh, I heard his stuff and he heard mine, and uh, like two weeks later he phoned me and said, hey, let's do something together. And then we found out that we live very close to each other, like 15 kilometers. And uh, we did a session, and the session turned out to to have very interesting parts in it. And uh, I, I I I took the recordings and uh, put it into my into my uh, computer and kind of looped and edited. And then we started uh, putting stuff on top, and it turned out to be. The record we we published, you know, yes. Krautwerk, and the name we found very interesting because first of all, Eberhard was part of of the uh, uh, Kraftwerk originators, and he managed to uh, to to create a poster in those days, you know, with the with the uh, the, the fonts, you know, with the uh, letters, and we took these original letters from him and put that on the on the album cover, yeah, this is uh, how we met. Yes, know. and another thing is interesting: the name uh, Kaltwerk is not. This is not our idea. It is uh, the idea of f- friends from from England, from London, uh, uh, London friends, mu- music music fans uh, uh, heard what we the music we make made and said, "Oh, this is uh, crowd music." So you you can say the band or the, the album title could be crowd work, no? the, the work of crowds, right, yeah. the shit crowds, <laughs> yeah, the shit <laughs> shit <laughs> crowd. No? So, but then we said not crowd work, but crowd work. Yeah. It is and, and half it, German, half yeah. English, and it sounds very similar. You know, the German 
writing, and if you pronounce it in English, it's it's very close to Kraftwerk, Krautwerk, Krautwerk, Kraftwerk. Yeah. You know? And we we like the idea. You know, there's a there's an irony behind it. You know. <laughs> Because we don't want, we never wanted to copy Kraftwerk in any, in any parts, you know. It because, just yes, I mean it's it's pop music, and uh, Eberhard was in in Kraftwerk when they improvised music, uh, almost like we did, you know. And yes. so we we see it a bit like uh, a connection to these old uh, forms of creating music they did in the early or in the late yes. early mid about 1970. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we uh, Harald and me, we, we are now working like like Kraftwerk in, in the early times about 1970. Uh, a combination of uh, electronic music with real instruments, like uh, I, I played uh, a cello Hawaiian guitar, the same as today, and we we co we co uh, combined it with, with uh, electronic stuff. Well, I'm using. I mean, very modern electronic recording equipment. Yes, and what we are now doing is we're only we're only <laughs> we're only cheating halfway, you know. Yes, <laughs> yes. We make a part, some some rhythm parts we take from the computer loops, yeah. loops but, but we make uh, live music. Uh, Harold with drums, and I play cello, uh, violin, so. uh, violin guitar. It is much. I think. I think it is much better. It is fun for us to play live, and it is better for for public for for the people to seeing us. It's interesting you say that though about about wanting to perform live because one of the first interviews I did for this podcast was with uh, a guy called Jay Wilgoose Esquire. He's in a band called Public Service Broadcasting um, in the UK, mm -hmm. and uh, they're quite. Uh, Basically, the, the whole idea with them is they take old public information films and oh, sample wow. them and put it to sort of new music. Um, and he'll play guitar and synth and they'll have a, they have a drummer and they'll loop it all on stage and play the oh, samples yeah. on stage. And he's yeah. very... Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of um, sort of kraut rock influence, actually, in some of the stuff they do. Oh, um, yes. Um, but... Um, they're, he's very uh, assertive that everything they do must be live, and he wants as as minimal as minimal amount of sort of playback as possible. Mm. He he wants to do it all mm. live, so it's interesting that you sort of echo the same sort of sentiment. Yeah, I mean um, the the DJ culture, you know, like kind of invented that, you know, and I, I'm I'm full of respect because you know some. Guys, uh, you know, they, they played, you know, with uh, two or even three turntables and creating yeah. new music and letting it uh, run parallel, which is uh, amazing and, and very, very interesting. Uh, Carl Cox, I was once behind Carl Cox watching him working. It was amazing. And this, I mean, this DJ culture kind of influenced the use of uh, uh, loops in, 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 in music work. And, uh, well, we... We do that, and it, this might be an influence from this side, you know, because we don't want to get stuck in in the in the past, you know. Because I I personally don't like the always the the, the, the look backwards, you know. And, and mm -hmm. there's so much music nowadays, you know, popular, which for my taste is old, and it's looking backward, you know. Yes. One thing is interesting. Uh, um, in Germany, I think there are now five, six, or seven original Krautrock bands playing, like Guru Guru, Tangent Dream, and all this, and they are playing uh, the same thing as uh, yeah, 1970. In, in, the, in the last, yeah. in the last uh, year, we played together with Manny Neumeyer, very good drummer, with uh, uh, from Guru Guru, we played with us together. This was okay, but sometimes they, they play, when their guru gurus play, they always play the same stuff as in former times with the same instruments, drums, bass, and two guitars. It is, it is no change. It is really 40, 50 years the same sound, and we want to try to do another thing, that, that we, we, we are persons from the same time, from 1970 working, but we, we put the feeling of, of the old time 
into modern uh, technique, into modern instruments. And so we are more modern than the most other crowd rockers. It's interesting because I was actually going to ask you about how uh, with technology involving how that change how that changes your approach to making music from the 70s to now but it sounds like actually you just sort of embrace the modern technology pretty pretty much yeah i mean like- it it, ha- it like it happened to me in the very early 70s when i uh, had i had a rock band i was a drummer making playing with a rock band classic rock music and uh, we had a record company and that was a record com- company that uh, had Tangerine Dream, Klaus Schulze, Ashra, uh, Popol Vu. and so I met these people and when I heard the first time a sequencer I was fascinated and we created some music then and I couldn't do rock music anymore. It's, uh, immediately it was boring hell and uh, <laughs> since that I really like uh, 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 se- sequencers. I mean, as a drummer, you know, a sequencer is, a, is an incredible groove m- uh, machine, and uh, I really loved it from the first moment. Some drummer in those days said oh, they were scared, you know, because it's, it's so it's so mechanical and it kind of push you to 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 listen. And uh, for me, it was a thrill, and, and I never had problems to accompany a sequencer because it's a it's a nice tension between. Uh, the irregularities a drama creates and the, the perfect timing uh, a, a machine does. And this uh, combination somehow seems to attract people. And I was from the beginning fascinated by electronic music because if you use a, a synthesizer, you know, it's, it's, it's relative. You can create a bass sort of thing. You can uh, do drums with it. You can do any kind of... Uh, uh, how, how do you say that? Uh, um, frequency range, what you like, you know, and this is fascinating. Uh, you know, when you have a guitar, it's it's limited to to what everybody does with guitars since a couple of centuries, especially rock musicians, and uh, uh, it's it's not easy for a guitarist to be creative in a sense of being original very original and, and unique, you know, so most of them, even if they're really good, they, there's an Eric Clapton or whatever, and uh, this is the way you have to cope with, And but with electronic music, it's always, a, it gives you a space being unique, you know, and uh, it's, I don't know, that's, this is my kind of view, you know. When you when you guys started making music or sort of exploded onto the music scene, um, there was a lot of like experimentation. Um, whereas now, doesn't seem to be too much. And you sort of pointed out that it's, now it's sort of repetitive. It's just sort of doing what's been done before. Do you feel like yeah. modern music is lacking? In, in that way. Yeah, I mean, when we, we were growing up, uh, getting in touch with Indian music, African music, and so uh, we, we were able to, uh, to create something with such influences. And, and in these days, you know, because of the internet and this incredible flood of information, whatever, you know, music, you, 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 you mention it, uh, you, you, uh, you say it, um, um, it's just too much, you know, everything has been done. It's quite, it's not, or it's much more complicated to create something original these days than it was uh, back in the 70s. Yeah. You know? I mean, when, when we were, we were listening very much to Anglo-American music and uh, every week somebody came out with an album completely, you know, new and uh, surprising. <clears throat> and in these days, most of the popular music, you know, reminds me somehow, you know, and uh, kind of it's it's a lot, lot lot of stuff is boring, you know. And I think there's there there must be an underground, uh, but uh, because it's been over flooded by by mainstream, it's really hard to to get in touch with that or to, and to follow that, you know. 
maybe YouTube, but the, the regular channels like BBC, TV, German popular TV, you know, that's most of the stuff is boring what they broadcast. And but by searching YouTube, you know, then this is could be a way, you know. I mean, young people they don't they don't read regular papers or they don't watch TV anymore. You know, my I have young kids, you know, they they are completely uh, keen to 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 YouTube and, and the internet, and, and then they're 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 having their their channels to to uh, discover new stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess with it's kind of it's kind of six of one, half a dozen, half a dozen of the other. Really, I, I don't know if that's an expression that translates in German, but um, um, but it's it you know it's we we I guess growing up. So I, I sort of I'm, I was born in ninety five. So I've I've not had the internet my whole life, but you know it's been a significant part of my life that, that the internet's been around. Yeah. Um, so I, I've, you know, I'm probably one of the first generations to really sort of start growing up with it. And, yeah. um, it's, it's kind of, I, I agree in the sense that, you know, there's, there's so much out there now that if you really want to find something, you can, you can, you can go down the YouTube rabbit hole or you can, you know, you've got Spotify where everyone's got everything on and. Mm. Um, but also in a way it sort of makes you, you so you think of it as this big expansive thing but actually it it really sort of funnels in I find it's like you you start listening to one thing and then that's all you're given because of the way you know YouTube and stuff works it's like oh you like this thing so here are five other things that are exactly like the thing you like over here yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I on the other hand, you yeah you have the choice in these days, much more choice. Yeah. In in the in in, this, in the sixties, seventies, you know, we heard radio, and uh, they uh, they they dictated what we what we were able to hear, and and some were progressive, great. But in these days, you know, everybody is uh, broadcasting his personality, you know, in boring or interesting way, and uh, via these new uh, a media you can connect if you're lucky you find something which is very interesting and there is a lot of stuff because i don't think that th this generation now is boring and they don't they don't have ideas i think they have as much ideas as we have maybe even more because uh, there's much more information you know and much more possibilities you know i, I see the developments in electronics you know in music in, in computers in uh, roboting whatever you know and uh, there are people behind that are very very creative and so um it but it takes it takes uh, interesting and research to to find being connected with these mm. people you know I, I I have another idea about all this. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I I don't like ninety percent of the music or ninety five percent of the music running today. What you in the radio and television on YouTube for me it is all shit. <laughs> I don't. I I know so many uh, good musicians here in Germany. Yeah. Very good musicians. They, they studied music even at, at high, high school or uh, university. They are <coughs> on instruments, they are much better than I am. But they pl play normal music. Oh, Duh -duh -duh. Now, you told something, now I <laughs> you have another opinion. I tell what I have my opinion. So, so many, I know so many uh, wonderful musicians, but they play normal things. I come, I'm coming from the jazz scene. And in the jazz scene today, even especially in, in Cologne, there are some very, very good uh, musicians, trombone players, uh, piano, bass, trumpet, all this, very, very good. And But they play jazz like people played 50 years right. ago. Now it's uh, modern time, but the, most of the musicians... Uh, from the scene I come from, they play the same music you know from 
something 1950, 1960. Oh, nay. I think if you, if you live today in this, in our modern time, so many things are happening. You must, you must get the feeling of the social things around you. And you must put this in your heart and put it in the music. And the people I know I spoke about, they don't. They only play a trumpet, trombone, boom, drums. And the people just, I know too. <laughs> 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 yeah, for example, Niels Farm. I don't know whether you yes. heard of Niels Farm, you know. Yeah, that's he, an awesome. Great musician. He, he, he's, he's classical trained, and then he <laughs> said, oh, it's boring, you know, repeating classical. Like Eberhardt, he was classical trained and find it boring after a while. And uh, and Niels Farm does, does, you know, electronic, uh, piano playing live on stage, improvisation, and he has a friend, and then they do incredible great videos, you know, film at their studio like we did, uh, but it was, it's, I think it's, it was more dense, like, like the stuff we did, you know. Um, our long video, from my point of view, it's like, I don't know, 40, 50 percent good and some stuff I wouldn't uh, publish these days, you know. But Niels Fromm, he's putting out stuff that is all the way through great and he does concerts all over the world and he's, he's getting more and more popular yes. and uh, a lot of people from my generation they don't know him but it's he's such a great musician yes, he's, he's a young, young dude and uh, i love that stuff and there are many young people out there even in germany they they do in very interesting stuff you know but i mean okay the the, the mainstream always was boring i mean even yes. in the 60s when we loved the beatles you know but after a while Wow, well, it's boring. It's, uh, it was uh, teeny music, and and uh, and I'm always find it very frustrating meeting people my age. They still say, "Oh, with the Beatles, you know, everything ended, you know," and they're still listening to that stuff. Yeah. I mean, okay, you can do it from time to time, you know, but uh, for me, that is very boring. And looking backward in time, I'm 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 looking. Uh, forward and I'm, I'm I'm opening to anything that is created right now, you know, and reflecting the times, reflecting the technique, reflecting the politics, reflecting uh, social life. That's art, you know, and then uh, our authenticity. That's that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. okay. It's interesting you say that though, because I saw I in in sort of doing a bit of research for this, I saw a. Uh, you did like a there was like a question and answer thing that's on YouTube of you two uh, mm -hmm. from last year and uh, Eberhard you said about how uh, you, you said a similar thing about how modern music is shysa and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you said about how when you were creating music in the 70s or when you started creating music it was all about it was about uh, like fighting everything, and um, yes. mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could talk about that a bit because that was quite interesting to me. Because uh, there's probably not that sense of fight as much anymore now. Maybe yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, maybe I mean, there is, we, but we, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, we 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 we're facing very dark times <clears> if <throat> we are unlucky. Well, especially you know? if you're bloody leaving and, the EU uh, like we are. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, we, we both grew up with parents that were more or less Nazis, you know. My father was a Nazi party member, and he adored Hitler, aged 16, when Hitler came to power in 1933. He was 16, and they were brainwashed. They loved it until suddenly there was a war, you know, and uh, after the war, you know, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. They denied fucking everything, and uh, they didn't ask, answer our questions, and we had so many questions, what was happening? You know, when I was 14, my school class went to Bergen-Belsen, you know, the, the concentration uh, camp, which was uh, quite close to where I grew up. And I was shocked, you know. Uh, in, in school, the te most of my teachers were Nazis, you know. They were Wehrmacht mm. soldiers, in, uh, and they didn't want to speak about it, you know. So uh, history lessons was just like, you know, middle age, blah, blah, blah. And... Uh, and uh, so we didn't get substantial information, and uh, that created a rebellion in the in the late 60s. You know, the the youth was 
going on the barricades. The students rioted in Frankfurt, in in Berlin, in Paris, and uh, 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 you know, asking questions. What happened? And so many people in the German administration uh, were high-ranked people in the in the Nazi times. You know, until yeah, until the beginning seventies. You know, and uh, we sort of rebel rebel uh, against our parents. Uh, at the table, you know, I mean, um, almost until my father died, I was, uh, I had fights with him, you know, after five minutes, we had the Nazi theme on the table, and and I, I went uh, under the ceiling, and he too, and then it was horrible, you know, because it kind of really separated us, and on the other hand, it kind of really made us stuck together, you know, and that was, I mean, our generation had to handle this incredible uh, weight and on our shoulders and then it kind of uh, created ideas of like hippie hippies thing you know love and peace you know and away from this dark stuff and and it was a very illusionary utopia which did not work you know we're using drugs to, to to get away from the dark feelings you know we were carrying in us you know i had a incredible guilty complex uh, for a very long time being German and God, my God, what have we we done? Even that uh, personally, I was mm-hmm. much too young to uh, to be involved. And, uh, and that was probably part of the, I mean, subconscious wise, it was part of the motivations we had when, when we started making music or when I started making music. That was a, a big energy we, and you know, to, uh, to uh, to answer your uh, question about fighting, you know. Yes. Now I would like to explain from 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 my side. This 1967, 1970, it was a time of fighting, and uh, I had an, another kind of 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 of, of, of way of living. Uh, I studied music first, uh, d- double bass at the conservatory, classical music. And first I, I played classical music, 1960 to 70, something like this. I played in big orchestra, the double bass, Arco, something like uh, Handel, Bach, and all this, Vivaldi. But it, for me, after some time, it was boring because I had to, to play things. Uh, another uh, man had the idea to, 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 to make this. No? Another composer. I would, would I wanted to do my own yeah. thing, so so I, I, I changed it. I, I be, begin to play jazz first with double bass jazz. It was okay. Sometimes in the band I had a double bass solo. I could play what I want to do, but uh, after some years it was enough <coughs> for me too because the, the jazz music even today uh, it is uh, the same thing as fifty years ago. <laughs> 32 bars, you play F, C, B, and it is, uh, was heißt Wiederholung? Repetition. Repetition yeah. of all the settings. So I stopped this. <laughs> then I bought a, a tenor saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I could not play, uh, but, but I learned it by myself. I, I played something like free jazz. <laughs> Something like this, and this is all okay for me. <laughs> and then I bought you a little <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then I bought a little <clears throat> guitar, electric bass, and a cello, and all this. I played many different instruments. Then I lived in Düsseldorf, and um, uh, I made a performance with Josef Beuys in this style with my band Piss Off. And uh, Florian Schneider Esleben, who was later in Kraftwerk, he heard this. He was uh, still a uh, 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 very young man. He was a pupil, but he liked my kind of music. And so we began to make uh, experimental music too, only Florian and me. And uh, one year later, another man came to us, in the, to, into our band. It was Ralf Hütter, who is now the, the, the only boss of these Kraftwerk things. And... Uh, uh, this was a time, 67 to 70, 1970, 71, very free. And it, this, this was a fight, which is a, f- a fighting time with a lot of power and free music and a fight against all the shit around us. 
This was very important. And even now I'm an old man, <laughs> I'm 73 years old, but I have the same feeling in me. And this is interesting when we make our crowdwork music, Harold and me, the same thing comes out when we are playing live. Next Tuesday, we fly to China. We have a concert in China, in Shenzhen. And then but when we are standing on stage, we begin to play, and then suddenly, bam! <laughs> There's an explosion of sounds on violin, Hawaiian guitar, and the voice, something, <laughs> wild things. And for me, this is important, to do something against the, the, the normal, the, the normal uh, kind of music, the normal feeling. I must uh, ausflip and to flip out to make another thing. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so it's very interesting that he was, he's always... You know, he's, he has seems that he has no limits, you know, he's yes. always, <laughs> and, and so I kind of have to can, canalize, 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 canalize uh, his, uh, his outputs, you know, yes. and this is, on the other hand, he, you know, I, I came from completely opposite, I was, I, I came from making uh, music in an anarchistic form, I never learned music, and uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm more into structures and uh, and, uh, and and rhythm and stuff and melodies. And uh, he kind of left this, you know. And so we 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 come together. And uh, I like very much his, you know, his going over the limits and putting out very interesting sounds and uh, strange rhythms. And uh, with modern equipment, you know, you can kind of repair it here and there, but to keep an interesting atmosphere. And uh, that's how we do our music, yeah. Does that ever, does that yes. ever um, I, I've just got this image in my head of you two recording and uh, with Eberhard going, you know, creating all these crazy sounds and you sort of trying to like rein it in a lot of the time. Is that sort of what the <laughs> process is, is like? Yeah, I mean, on, on, on stage, I have a main, a, a main fader for him, you know, so I bung <laughs> <laughs> and then go, and then that's okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, he can do what he wants and uh, I, I, I can do what I want. As far as I'm, as I can control him. <laughs> but that's quite nice, though. That's kind of like that. That sounds to me like a, a good, uh, like you're well suited to each other, really, because. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's also uh, you know, um, it's also from a human to human thing. It's, it can be create problems too, you know, because we are different and. Uh, Sometimes uh, there are little clashes, of course, you know, but this, yeah, this is, I mean, we're old enough not leaving the band after a little <laughs> clash, you know. And this, this is the interesting thing in the our band Krautwerk. We are very different persons and we, are, we make different kinds of music. But to put this together, this is very, very interesting. Uh, before I, I met Harald, I played in the free improvisation scene. All, all uh, people are friends, all very, very crazy, <laughs> with all instruments, very good musicians. But uh, it, it is a very special scene with not so many uh, visitors at the concerts. And now we work together, it is much better because uh, millions are coming. <laughs> millions. <laughs> Harold is making very good rhythm. Sure. With his drums and his computer sounds, bah, very good sounds, and I, I use the sound to put my shit over it, and this this is good combination. Mm. I like this, Harald likes it, and the people like it too. So I I I, I, I just like it because it sells so. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we get so much money. Oh, <laughs> yeah. no, but I know what you mean because it's um, I guess. Uh, for, uh, free improvisation isn't to necessarily everyone's taste because you've got a, I, I feel like it's kind of one of those things where because I quite enjoy it but you have to sort of tune your ears to it I think you know it takes a bit it takes a bit of time to sort of once you get into it you, you sort of really get into it but it's the it's the, the first few minutes you're kind of like trying to get your bearings a little bit uh, somebody said, if you're really successful and you're really uh, uh, 
bring the masses to love you, you know, then you have to ask yourself what you have done wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, to, 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 to get huge masses means you have to be, you have to do common stuff. You yeah. Know? You know, because otherwise, I mean, art, good art always provokes the 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 the, the un, because it's unknown you know it's it, it has not much experience from 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 tradition you know and uh, so that's why it it probably needs to get used to it you know and then you you see you, then you feel the energy which is much much more from my point of view much much more entertaining you know good art is much more entertaining than you know the su surface muzak mainstream stuff. Do you think it's too easy for people to make music now? Sort of, because anyone can make an album on their laptop pretty easily. Yeah, that's right. That's easy. There's a lot of preset stuff, you know, you just buy a couple <laughs> of things and then you're pressing knobs and that's possible. But uh, that's that's not our thing, you know. We, I like to, I mean, I, I'm not a, a great uh, technician on, on, on a piano and I'm maybe not on the drums too, but uh, I love it, you know, and I do what I really like and then there should be a little craftsmanship too and, and uh, experimentation, you know, not taking uh, 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 presets. I'm not, I don't want to say that I'm not using presets, but if I use a preset, I change it. Yeah. You know, I just use it as an inspiration and then change it. And that's why, you know, there's a, this trend for analog synthesizers right now. It's a huge trend. I just came from a, a music fair, a music industry fair from Berlin, and uh, so many output and... I mean, these old hogs, they didn't have presets. And then, you you know, it's it's still very open and you can turn knobs and you never can uh, use the same sound again. And it's always different. And that's and it sounds great. You know, it's like uh, compared to, to, the, to the virtual synthesizers we have in the, in the recording equipment. Uh, it sounds completely different. It sounds like the difference between a cheap Chinese uh, uh, violin and a Strativari. Because I, I, I read something about you when you were recording Synthesis. You had to, you had to, um, you had to like heat your Moog with a lamp or something to like stop it from going yeah. out. Like it would go flat or sharp if you didn't regulate the temperature. It was. It was such a, I mean, it was such a horrible situation sometimes. And it was, you know, it wasn't, we weren't, I wasn't even able to record two sequences parallel until somebody soldered me a cable where I can kind of format one of the eight tracks I had uh, uh, for recording. So I, I kind of formatted it with a, um, how do you say that, with a frequency that was vice versa changed into a, a, a CV a control voltage uh, power so I could uh, uh, kind of run a second sequence in parallel. But So I, I just recorded the first one and then it was okay and then the second one and after five minutes I found out the first one's gone out of tune horribly. <laughs> so I had to do it again and again and that was very frustrating. <laughs> and <coughs> to get the mini MOOC uh, somehow Tune stable, we know I use this, this this light bulb and uh, put it very close to the to the to the AC socket and then it somehow worked you know they, uh, these these analog uh, uh, and st still today are not uh, uh, tune stable like it was you know when in, in the 80s when when the when digital uh, synthesizers came out you know you just press a knob and then in the until now, it's completely 440, A440 stable, no problem at all, you know. You, I mean, but it's interesting to get a little bit out of tune, you know, things. You know, and now you, you, you turn the virtual knobs to get, uh, you know, these uh, frequency, out of tune frequencies that makes the whole thing interesting. Yes, like I'm, I, I mean, 
fairly early days with it, but I've started recording some music. Um, Eberhard would probably hate it. It's all guitar music. Um, so <laughs> you probably think it's boring. Um, but um, I'm really... I've, I've sort of set the rules for myself that I don't... Because uh, obviously I'm recording it on my laptop with my guitar and stuff, but I don't want to sort of... I don't want to make sure... I don't want to, like, time flex it so that it's, you know, perfectly in time. I, like, yeah, my guitar's yeah, yeah, slightly yeah. out of tune in one of my songs, and I'm kind of like, well, I quite like just keeping it like that. and yeah, Because yeah. I feel like so often imperfections is sort of what makes something. Yeah. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the, in the, in the Islam, you know, there is, uh, people who, uh, who make carpets, you know, they leave a huge mistake in the, in the knitting you know, of, of a carpet and to, to not touch the perfect, the perfectionism of Allah and the, God creation, yeah. Yeah. and that's why they leave a mistake, you know. And uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's I I, I, I agree. Yeah. So there you have it, Krautwerk, Eberhard, and Harold. Thank you very much to them for. Uh, for doing the show and thank you to you the listener for listening this week um it is much appreciated and as always you can follow us at all the usual places itunes spotify head over to instagram at the last line podcast follow us there for updates on the show and some lovely pictures of guests new and old um next time We are joined for the series finale, I know, very sad, uh, by criminal defence lawyer and star of Making a Murderer, Jerry Buting. That's very exciting. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, And that's not me being sarcastic at all, by the way. I've been told I have a sarcastic manner in my uh, sarcastic tone in my voice when I speak. Makes me sound insincere. I've been picked up on it at work. Um, at awards nights, of all places, reading out people's um, bloody nominations for awards. Makes them feel undeserving of awards uh, when I'm reading out the cards, apparently. Um, but it's not the case. It's just my voice. I can't help it. And uh, don't. Do tune in next time because uh, the conversation we, um, me and Jerry had it's, it's very interesting. I think um, I think you'll get a lot of out, out of it if you uh, if you tune in. Uh, so yeah, make sure to follow us. Head over to Patreon dot com forward slash the last line where you can give us some of, some of your money, and I will see you next time for the series finale of the last line.